You know, ladies and gentlemen, back in the day, and it was it was real. Young female fans love two rock and roll heartthrobs or pop rock, country rock heartthrobs, Elvis and Conway Twitty. Now, this inspired one of the best musicals of all time, which ended up being a big screen movie. Ironically, uh, in early 2013, I had to be admitted to the Chalmers uh, Community Hospital in Franklin, uh, New Brunswick, because I took a breakdown because I thought my vision wasn't going to come back. One of the last things I remember before I had my breakdown was how Bye Bye Birdie was a very well-structured movie. It kept me in reality. Now, 10 years later, I look back and say, hey, you know, uh, it just happened uh, to be what was on. But I was really appreciative of the movie long before that incident happened, like back in the 1970s when I first saw it. And the guy who played Conrad Birdie, uh, was probably one of the most interesting Renaissance people in entertainment of his era, Jesse Pearson. Now, Jesse Pearson, born Bobby Wayne Pearson, August 18, 1930, in uh, Seminole, uh, Oklahoma, was an American actor, singer, director, and writer. Now, according to published reports, he was Aboriginal background because uh, a lot of Pearsons were related to the original Aboriginal tribes back in the day. Now, he started his music career on Decca Records with little success. He was heard by composer Charles Strauss, who recommended him for the national tour of the musical Bye Bye Birdie, playing Conrad Birdie, which was a combination of Elvis again and Conway Twitty. When, of all people, Dick Gautier, one of the very underrated comedy actor, uh, 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 fell ill, Pearson took the role uh, of the, again, the rock impresario that was driving the women mad. He repeated the characterization in the 1963 film version of Bye Bye Birdie. Now, that performance really stands out because it's not really a cameo. It's not really supporting uh, acting performance. But his performance of the song, Sincere, you got to be sincere, in a gold lamy one-piece outfit in front of a bunch of screaming girls and uh, male teenagers who hated his guts. Probably one of the most unique performances in movie history. And he wasn't nominated for Best Supporting Actor at the Globes or the Oscars, where I think if you look at it, uh, for some people, that's the best scene of the 1960s when it comes to rock and roll. Now, he repeated his characterization again in that movie. It was followed by performance in the Glen Ford comedy Advance to the Rear. But he had, as he had no more film offers, he turned to television, appearing in such shows as Bonanza, The Andy Griffith Show, McHale's Navy, The Great Adventure, and The Beverly Hillbillies. In the next decade, Pearson narrated the film The Norseman, a Viking saga starring Lee Majors and Cornell Wilde. If you can find it, it's a very interesting movie. Now, the big question about Pearson as well, and it wasn't really uh, delved deep, of, of undetermined sexuality. As expressions of sexuality became culturally more free, he eventually wrote two adult films, Pro Ball Cheerleader in 79 and The Legend of Lady Blue in 78, which he also directed, both under name A. Fabrizi. Now, Pearson was also the narrator of many albums, including Rob McCoon's The Sea in 1967 and Home to the Sea in 68, as recorded by the San Sebastian uh, Strings, as well as The Body Electric and The Body Electric 2, two LPs based on poems by Walt Whitman, with music by McCune released in the early 70s. The album tribute to the, the songwriter Woody Guthrie. We Ain't Down Yet, and two religious albums by Jamie Mendoza Nava and Jesus Said, and Meditation and Psalms, also in 1976. Pearson also recorded The Glory of Love for R.C. Victor, which remains unreleased to this day. Now, unfortunately, he was diagnosed with cancer and moved to Monroe, Louisiana, to be near his mother, passing away there at the young age of 49 on December 5th. 1979. So as a deeper delve into uh, Pearson's career, we're going to uh, quote from a very interesting site. It's called musicweird.blogspot.com, a very interesting site for people looking at the background of certain, you know, obscure or interesting singers. Now, when he played uh, Conrad Birdie's 63 film, Bye Bye Birdie, was at the time one of the most uh, popular movie musicals of that era. Now, according to the site, for a guy who's uh, starred in such a high-profile film, Pearson had very little written about him. He had a fascinating career and died too young, so today Music Weird will try to fill in some gaps in story of this multi-talented singer-actor, which I considered, again, a Renaissance man. 
Now, his first single was released by New York's K.O. Record Company in 59. The A-side was a remake of the Hank Snow song, I'm Moving On, and a single registered for one week at 105th on the music vendor pop chart. The following year, he caught a couple of unsuccessful singles for Decca. These efforts as a recording artist got him his gig as Birdie again, and uh, he took over for uh, Dick Gauthier, who was heard on the 60 Broadway cast album. Now, in the Bye Bye Birdie, the story of uh, Birdie's celebrity induction in the Army mirrors the Elvis Presley story and, of course, Conway Twitty personality. But the name Conrad Birdie is a spoof of Conway Twitty's name. Twitty was uh, was uh, considered Elvis uh, sound like back then with the song, of course, is only make-believe. Now, Pearson told a story about how he got the role to Louisiana newspaper, Lake Charles American Press in 1963. I came to New York after recording Executive. I heard me sing Southern Blues at a club in Texas. The records I cut were never released because when I was singing the blues, the country was uh, buying rock and roll. Back I went to the South for club dates. I cut tapes of my performances and sent them back to the record company. They were having trouble working out arrangements they felt would sell. They called in Charles Strauss, uh, who composed the score for Bye Bye Birdie. When he heard the tapes, he recommended me for the national company of the show. I got the part and spent a year traveling with the show all over the country. My records, unfortunately, still do, didn't do anything, but I enjoyed playing the part and gained a lot of valuable experience in both acting and singing. Unfortunately, I broke my ankle, was out of the show for a week, and then came back and played it with my foot in the cast. The skin-tight gold MA suit, which I mentioned before, that Pearson wore in Bye Bye Birdie, had to be altered so the legs could slip over his cast. The article went on to say, 25-year-old Jesse was born on a houseboat in Louisiana Bayou outside New Orleans. His grandfather was a fiery evangelist and brought Jesse along to sing at revivals. The transition to blues was a natural one. The picture had triggered his recording career. Now under contract at RCA's new single, One Last Kiss. Oh, oh, oh. just one last kiss. <laughs> From the picture, is still in release. Being ready to, for release in a few months is his album, The Glory of Love. In the past few years, he says, music has sort of come my way. Standards of blues are getting more and more popular. I'll also be on the soundtrack album being released by RCA. Whether people like his performance and music is still to be seen, one thing is certain, though. You'd like Jesse. He's a natural, smiling, warm guy. Now, when Bye Bye Birdie was uh, made into a film, Pearson kept the Birdie role, making the rare transition from stage to screen. Now, uh, the songs he performed on the soundtrack included Honestly Sincere, One Last Kiss, and A Lot of Living to Do. The album spent over a year in the Billboard album char charts, peaking at number two for two weeks. Now, as the late Charles Pretz American article mentioned, RCA Victor released Pearson's version of One Last Kiss as a single. It wasn't a hit, but Bobby V's cover version reached 112 on Billboard's Bubbling Under chart and 91 in Cashbox. For the rest of the 60s, again, he appeared mostly on uh, TV. And uh, in the Andy Griffith show with the Beverly Hillbillies, he played a singer. Now, in the late 1960s, Pearson worked part-time as a secretary for Rod McCune. And McCune has quite a bit to say about Pearson on his website. And uh, checked it out because Rod McCune is a good writer. He says that Pearson recording an unreleased album of love songs, maybe uh, maybe the never-released RC album, Glory of Love, that was mentioned in several news article stories in 63 an unofficial uh, album of Woody Guthrie songs. While working for McEwen, Pearson provided narration for a number of McEwen's album projects, like I had mentioned, uh, and the Sea Trilogy, the he, the Sea, Home to the Sea, and the, the Soft Sea, and two albums of what will be erotic poetry that McEwen set to music, Body Electric and Body Electric 2, with some homosexual, uh, what they call, overtones. Um, as, uh, all of the Sea albums, as well as a complete set of the three, were chart hits, the C spent 143 weeks on a Billboard album chart and was awarding a gold record for sales. In the 70s, Pearson did a lot of work in narration, even some of his film credits from the 70s, such as 1978's The, the Norseman were for narration. Somewhere in here, he narrated again those two Jamie Mendoza Nava religious albums. And um, the most surprising chapter, again, was for Ray and the Alton film business. Now, uh, now, uh, the uh, one book, uh, I mean, uh, one uh, one movie wrote The Legend of Lady Blues, a classic golden age attempt to meld explicit contact with sophisticated storytelling. The movie follows a young couple as the boy is drafted and sent off to the night in Vietnam, and the girl falls into prostitution. 
At the end of the film, they meet again and un- uneasily rekindle their romance. The viewers left wondering where they can overcome their traumatic experience and reconnect, or if their ability to love and be loved is damaged beyond repair. Now, Pro Ball Cheerleaders is an adult comedy. It was remembered today, if at all, for an explicit outdoor scene in a pouring rain that gave actress Lisa Del- Delieu pneumonia. It's a goofy, low-budget movie in which none of the football players and cheerleaders look like they could be actually football players or cheerleaders. Now, on McEwen's website, he answered a question from Reed or asked if Pearson was gay. McEwen replied, if I knew the answer to your query, I probably wouldn't tell you anyway. Now, anyway, that uh, was the end of the line for Pearson. Unfortunately, he had cancer and moved back to Monroe uh, to be, treated, uh, to be uh, treated by his uh, beloved mother, but he passed away. Now, some people seem to think that Pearson disappeared or faded away after Bye Bye Birdie, but his albums were in the pop charts for over three years in the late 60s and early 70s. Again, he was awarded a gold record, and he continued to rack up album, film, and television credits right up to his end of his passing. Pearson was a cool guy with an interesting career and a much better singer than even his performances in Bye Bye Birdie suggests. So for me, uh, you got to understand Elvis playing Elvis has no residence, but somebody else playing Elvis and Conway Twitty. And he presented himself. It's like, you look at Dick Gauthier, and I always like Dick Gauthier because he also played that Robin Hood the series for Mel Brooks. Uh, Dick Gauthier, very underrated actor. But I like the George Hamilton, Dick Gauthier, kind of handsome, but not too handsome, but as someone who looks like a, you know, like a, like a, a male, <laughs> a male cowboy. Tremendous. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you're doing here with our Ventures Movie Podcast, let us know with a like, comment, subscribe, or share. Bye.